Maybe I want to start by thanking you all for for coming. Uh, it's a, it's my pleasure to stand before you and uh, hopefully not bore you with, uh, with God's word, uh, but to bring to you the word of God. Uh, as it is in the bulletin, our passage is in Colossians chapter 1. I uh, will read from verse 15 to 20. But before we read, uh, the letter to the Colossian was written to a very small group of believers, yet it is one of the most important uh, letters of the New Testament because of what it teaches about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul started the letter by introducing himself as his, his custom and he mentioned his appointment in verse 1. He then introduced Timothy, his companion, in verse 2. He then thanked God for the Colossians' faith in Jesus Christ and for their love for the saints in verse 3 up to verse 5. This faith and love was a result of the gospel that the Colossians uh, received from Epaphras, who was under the teaching of, of Paul. He then continued in verse 9 to 13 on his prayers to God for the Colossians to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God so that they can live lives that are worthy of the Lord and pleasing in every way, giving thanks to God the Father who qualified and rescued the Colossians and every believer, even us, from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the Son. Instead of continuing to, to tell us how believers or Christians are qualified and rescued from the, darkness, from the kingdom of the darkness, or how we are redeemed and our sins forgiven, the Apostle Paul in verse 15 rather tells us about who the Son of God is, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sin. Now our passage tonight, verse 15 to 20, reads as follows. If you can read with me. I'm reading from the ESV version. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in, in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So far, the reading of God's word. Let's just pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We come to you in this moment, O oh Lord, and we ask that you reveal your truth to us, that we will live by it and be guided by it. Come now, O oh Lord, and speak to us as we look to your word. In your name we pray. Amen. 
Now, the church at Colossae was not planted by Paul himself, but it was the result of his third missionary work. During the apostles' three year ministry in Ephesus, a Colossian man named Epaphras was among those who, who heard the gospel proclaimed by Paul, and he responded. This man then returned to Colossae, his hometown, and shared the good news there, which resulted in the birth of the Colossian church. At the time of the writing of this letter, this man had come to Rome where the Apostle Paul was imprisoned and gave a report about what was going on in the church at Colossae. As a result of the report, the Apostle Paul did two things. First, he thanked God for the faith and the love of the Colossian believers in Jesus Christ and their love for the saints. And secondly, he introduced Jesus Christ once more to these believers at Colossae who were being led astray by a false teaching. The church at Colossae was facing a teaching that insisted that to know God and have full salvation, Christians must have superior insight into the spiritual realms, worship spiritual beings like angels, and must submit to rituals like circumcision and observe strict rules about food and other things, which was legalism. Legalism is the idea that we earn favor with God through works. It teaches that we have to do a certain amount of work to end salvation. A salvation is not end. It is a gift of, of grace from God to us sinners by faith in Jesus Christ. Saying that salvation is end disqualifies the work of Jesus Christ on the cross on our behalf. And that was what was happening at Colossae. They were discrediting the sufficiency of Jesus Christ for salvation. Now if we can look at in chapter 2 verse 18, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive of Take, takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. This verse tells us that the challenge that was at Colossae was not an external one, but one which was within the church. It was within the church that the Christians of Colossae were warned not to be deceived by anyone about anything but to focus on who Christ is in all matters. It is believed that there was someone within the church at Colossae who claimed to have superior insight into spiritual matters and was deceiving Christians in the church to practice certain rituals and taboos. The Apostle Paul then wrote this letter to the Colossians to refute this, this false teaching and show them the supremacy or the superiority of Jesus Christ in all things. Now, the superiority of Jesus Christ in all things, including our lives and everything else, lies in two most important questions that we could ever answer. Who you say Jesus Christ is and whether you know him. Now you either know who Jesus Christ is, that is to know his identity, who he really is, or you don't. And you either know him by having a relationship with him or you do not. And there is no middle ground in this. It is upon these questions and upon our answers to these questions that our salvation hinges. Who we say he is 
is the evidence of whether we are Christians or not, and whether we worship him in truth or not. The Bible says, those who worship him must worship him in truth and in spirit. So the supremacy of Jesus Christ, therefore, is found in his personhood and in his work, which is the center of Christianity. There is no Christianity without the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that is what the heretics at Colossae distorted. Or as Pastor Marines would say, this is where the Colossian ship was drifting from into the ocean of heresy. Now in this passage, Apostle Paul achieved this goal of addressing this heresy by first relating Christ to God in verse 15 and in relation to creation in verse 16 and 17 and in relation to the church and redemption in verse 18 to 20. Now in relation to God in verse 15, Jesus Christ is God. He is the visible image of the invisible God. Because God is invisible, Jesus Christ is the visible image of the Father. And the word image here refers to a copy or a perfect representation of something or someone. Jesus Christ is the divine manifestation of God in human flesh. When Philip, one of his disciples, asked him to show them the Father in John chapter 14, verse 8 to 10, I think we must, let's just stand there, John chapter 14, verse 8 to 10. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? And verse 9, 19 of our passage too makes it clear that all the fullness of God dwells in him. That means all that God is or the all being of God dwells in him fully. He is God in flesh. The second part of verse 15 is known to be the point where misunderstanding arises from. The firstborn over all creation. This does not mean that he was a created being, rather it speaks of his position or rank, not his order or time in, in creation. And in Greek, and both in Greek and in Jewish culture, the firstborn referred to the first son who had the right of inheritance or a person appointed to be the heir of, of the family, not necessarily someone who was born first. Firstborn was used to denote one who is chief or who is highly distinguished or superior among many. Jesus was the anointed one in all creation, one set apart for a specific purpose. The, the only better way I could understand this was uh, to put it in military where superiors are not really those that are recruited or that are recruited first, but those that are given ranks, even if they, they came or were recruited recently, if they are given a, a rank, then they will be superior to, to all others. And I thought of uh, a royal family. Only a son 
is uh, having the right to, to inherit. That way they are the heir and they have the superiority above all the other members of the family. Now, our understanding of his deity, that is Jesus Christ, our understanding of the deity of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our understanding of his identity and his superiority in all things. In relation to creation, Jesus Christ is the creator and sustainer of all things. Verse 16 to 17. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or power or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus Christ did not come into existence when he was born of the Virgin Mary. He is eternal. He created all, all things in heaven and on earth. And speaking of his self-existence and eternality, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 58, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Or as he prayed in his priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 5, he said, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus was not created like everything else. He is the creator. The famous prologue of the Gospel of John in John chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says, of the incarnate word of God, he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In verse 17 comes the crossroad where the Jehovah's Witness got it all wrong. It says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Now, the Jehovah's Witness claims that Jesus was, the crea was created first before all things. But He who was there before anything else was created is eternal. He said of himself, I and my father are one, which almost got him stoned by the Jews who correctly understood what he was talking about. He claimed equality with God, which they understood to be blasphemy. And in him, all things hold together. He, unders he sustains his creation continually, preventing it from falling apart. Everything else is in their places. The sun is in its right place, not too close to earth to burn us up, not too far either that we could freeze up. Our planet is turning as it should, all because Jesus Christ is upholding everything by his powerful word. And in him, we live and move and have our being. Acts chapter 17, verse 28. Nothing happens by itself. It is all held together by the divine power and authority of Jesus Christ through his word. Now, in relation to the church and redemption, Jesus Christ is Lord. Verse 18 to 20. He is the head of the body the church. Now the church referred here is not any particular congregation as that at Colossae, but the universal church of all believers who have come to believe in Jesus Christ. The church 
is a body. As a body is an organic thing in which Christ is the head and the believers are the parts of the body that function in response to the head. The headship of Christ in the body refers to his leadership in the church, not only as head of government and direction as the king is the head of state or the president has the right to prescribe laws, but also a head of vital influence as the head in the natural body for all grace and strength too. He is the beginning and firstborn from the dead. As mentioned earlier, he is first born in position and rank, not in chronological order of things. Not that he was literally the first one that was raised from the dead, but that he was the preeminent one among those that were raised from the dead. That is that he has the highest position even in death. And all these things were made this way so that the Son of God will have supremacy in all things, that he should have superiority as God and superiority as creator and sustainer and superiority as the head and Lord of the church. God did all this because in Jesus Christ, his fullness was pleased to dwell. He did it for his pleasure and for his glory. It pleased God the Father that Jesus Christ had the first place in everything, in dignity, power, authority, and all the deity as the creator and sustainer and redeemer of the people of God. We have no need to look to heaven or search the earth beneath for any revelation of God's character. And we do not need to be doubtful of who God is, because in Jesus Christ, the fullness of God dwells, and the invisible God is made visible. Therefore, in Christ, we can know the love of God that surpasses all knowledge. And Jesus Christ is sufficient for everything necessary to redeem and save his people. There is nothing necessary that we can do or that angels or any other spirit can contribute to our salvation. And everything that the church needs to fulfill her mission and to stand against trials like the heresy at Colossae is found in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. What then shall we say? Can a person lose his or her salvation? Definitely not. If they claim that they have lost it, it is a clear sign that they were not saved in the first place. For Jesus said, I will lose none of those that you have given me. Is Christ enough for our salvation? Oh yes, because salvation is found in no one else except Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Not angels or knowledge or power or science and technology can save us. Only Jesus Christ, because he is the creator and sustainer and Lord of all things. But the world we live in is full of enticing distractions that can easily tempt us to neglect the sufficiency of, of Christ to save us, change us, and satisfy us. He is superior in all things, and he must have superiority in our lives, our jobs, our decisions, and in our relationship with one another. Now may the grace of God, the Father, and the love of Christ our Lord be with us all as we strive to make Christ superior in all we are and in all we do. Thank you. Let's pray together.
Lord Jesus, you are our God, our Lord. We come to you and we look to you for everything. We ask you, O oh Lord, that in everything we return to no one or nothing else but to you. As your word, Lord, may it guide us and show us the real truth in this world that we live in. May each 